Are you sick of those time-lapse drawings and those sped up tutorials that give you a few tips but don't actually show you how the magic is happening? In this video, I'm trying something completely new for me. I am sharing my entire color pencil process from start to finish with you in real time. You're gonna be able to see exactly how I lay down the color, how I mix colors and build up that final texture and surface quality, and I am gonna be sharing with you in-depth instruction throughout the entire process. So at this point, all I've really done is transfer the drawing that I did on tracing paper onto my final drawing paper. And that's where the outline of the leaf comes from. Now I'm coming in with my colored pencil and I'm starting to add structure and form to my drawing. Here I'm working with a Derwent Lightfast colored pencil and this particular color is Champagne. The Derwent Lightfast color pencils are great for botanicals, leaves, flowers, any kind of highly detailed object and they lay down a really nice layer of color without getting too waxy or too thick too early on. The reason I picked this lighter color which is a little bit darker than the white of the paper is so that I can start mapping out the lightest areas in my composition and leaving space for them before I come in with my darker colors. This isn't something that I always do because in many drawings and compositions the lightest parts of my drawing are white and it's very difficult to map out white highlights or white shapes on a white paper. You really just can't see it and it ends up being kind of a waste of time if you can't see anything. But for this particular leaf, there is very little, if any, white on the leaf at all. So I am actually mapping in the lightest areas with a slightly off white colored pencil that's leaning more towards yellow. I'm coming in and I'm looking at the vasculature or the veins in the leaf, which are the areas that are catching the most light right now and I'm mapping those in which is giving the leaf some structure. It's breaking that larger shape down into smaller shapes so that I can come and zero in and zoom in in the individual areas. So I mentioned that I'm using the Derwent Lightfast color pencils. I'm also working on Derwent Lightfast paper and I really like the combination of these two products. One thing to mention about this paper is that it's a more warm, natural white. So if you compare it to the white printer paper that's underneath the actual leaf sitting next to it, it is going to be just a hair darker in value and warmer. So that's gonna be something you're gonna to wanna to take into account in your composition. So I'm working on what I would now consider the base layer. I've added that little bit of structure to help me guide the base layer with that lighter champagne. And now I'm using a grass green 70% to start mapping in all of the greens. Now there is a lot of variety within these greens, but for the sake of efficiency, I'm really just working with this one green and I'm mapping in at all of the greens that I see in this leaf. I'm using a light to mid amount of pressure. So think about handwriting pressure and then maybe just a little bit lighter. This is an area that's important to use fairly sharp colored pencils because the goal of the base layer is to get an established layer of color and to start working the colored pencil into the tooth of the paper. Now I do this a little bit more with mineral spirits later on and I'll show you that and talk about that, but it's important especially if you're interested in a really even mark that mimics the texture of the leaf, it's important that you are focused on using a controlled mark and that really is a lot easier to achieve with a sharper colored pencil. Now you'll notice that I am varying the weight and the pressure of the colored pencil. So I mentioned light to medium pressure, but right here next to the vein, I'm coming in with a little bit heavier pressure. And as those greens dissipate away from the highly concentrated green, I'm using lighter pressure. Sometimes I'm actually dragging green into parts of the leaf that appear a little bit more brown because if you take yourself back to color theory, red and green are on opposite sides of the color wheel and those complementary colors when they mix together are going to neutralize to a warm brown. So I've switched over to mapping in my reds, but if you take a close look at the reference leaf, there are a lot of different reds going on over 
over there. So I'm actually focusing on a specific family of reds right now. I'm looking at those reds that are a little bit darker and a little bit cooler. These are reds moving towards violet. So I picked out a colored pencil. This one in particular is called Deep Rose. So it's more of a red violet color and I'm mapping in just those specific areas that are the cooler deeper reds. I am paying really close attention to the direction of my mark because now that I'm moving out away from the stems, I'm going to be modeling the form and the volume of the leaf. Which way is the leaf bending and wrapping around? And I'm paying really close attention to that and then I'm using the stroke and the mark of my pencil to mimic that. So I go in between these kind of cross contour marks that wrap around the form and then I also use small light circles to fill in the tooth of the paper. And I'm going back and forth between those two marks as I build up this first initial layer. Here, my pencil stroke is actually changing slightly again. I'm coming in really tight and cleanly along that edge, and then I'm turning that edge that started out as an outline into a shape. I'm feathering the colored pencil away as I drag it in towards the midline of that segment of the leaf. I am doing this because I do want the edges of my leaf really clear. If I look over to my reference, that's a very specific hard edge along the contour of the leaf, but I don't want any part of this leaf to feel outlined. There is nothing that is going to make your work look more immature than to add heavy outlines around objects in your work. So start with a very light outline and then feather it in to turn it into a shape. The only real part of this drawing that you don't see in this video is my line work where I set up this leaf and I drew it on tracing paper with a pencil and an eraser. And I was paying really close attention to the structure of the leaf and the proportions. Then I took that drawing that was on tracing paper and I transferred it onto my final surface. And I'm going to make a video showing you that entire process and it'll be linked in the notes below once it's ready. The reason that I bring that up right now is because this was not a take a photograph, trace it, perfect proportions kind of situation. Instead, it is a study and a discovery process. And right here, I'm actually changing the proportions and the structure of the leaf a bit. I am looking very closely at my reference and every step along the way, I am editing what came first. This area down here at the bottom is a more obvious correction, but there are little adjustments and tweaks that are happening all along the way. Here I am physically bringing the bottom contour of the leaf up and I am scooching it up just a tiny bit but there is this little sliver of leaf that isn't going to be there anymore and the reason I've decided to make that adjustment is because this is an area that I can hide and camouflage in the leaf shadow or in the cast shadow. So I felt that it was okay to make this adjustment. If it was going to be an area that is on the stark bright white, I probably would have just worked in the original proportions that I mapped out because I won't be able to erase the original lines completely. So these corrections that I made to the original drawing were done with a new colored pencil called Raisin. And this is one of my all time favorite colors in the Lightfast set. One that I would totally recommend that you add to your collection because it's this really warm, deep, rich, red color that is great for portraits, great for botanical studies, great for animals. I really use it in everything. And it's great to add into like a 24 set if that's what you have to work with right now. And with this raisin, once that once I did the uh, repairs and adjustments, I'm coming in and I'm mapping in the darker, warmer reds. So these are a little bit different than the cooler reds that I mapped up, up at the beginning. And this raisin color will find its way into the top of a leaf, just like that cooler red will find its way down into the base of the leaf. If I use a color in one area, I really try to sprinkle it strategically throughout the drawing so that it 
feels connected. Here I'm moving in with a brighter red now and you can see down at the bottom part of that leaf that there are some really deep rich reds. But this red that I grabbed might have been a little too red right at the beginning so I'm toning it down and for efficiency's sake, I usually grab one color and move around, but if I notice right off that that's not quite the right color, I'll jump back and forth and modulate it until it is. And this strategy and technique will allow you to work with a smaller set of colored pencils. When you're working with a hundred set, it's easy to find just the color that you're looking for. But if you're working with a 24 set, you might need to slow down and modulate those colors by hand a little bit more. It isn't very often that I use a kneaded eraser in my work, but in an effort to lighten up the original drawing where that leaf was longer, I used the kneaded eraser and I dabbed at those original pencil lines and lifted them up. If I came in with the kneaded eraser or a vinyl eraser or a pink pearl eraser and I rubbed that, I would be pushing that pigment deeper into the, pe the paper and smudging it and it would look really gross. Clear scotch tape can even be used to remove or lighten pencil lines that you don't want or you can try a an, an electric eraser and I would just recommend removing those lines and lightening them up as much as possible before you add the cast shadow. Here I'm coming in with a light blue that's called Mid Ultramarine and this is another favorite pencil in this set because it's a very light value colored pencil that still has a really beautiful color to it. And I'm using this light blue for a couple reasons. I want to lay out a very soft cast shadow and I want to build up the color carefully and slowly, but I don't want it to go just gray and to be really boring. I want there to be life and interest in this shadow without detracting from the leaf. So I'm mapping in the shape of the cast shadow with this light blue. I'm keeping the edges of the cast shadow really soft so that they are in contrast to the harder, crisper edges of the leaf. And I actually talk about this in a previous video, how important the softness is in these cast shadows. And I learned that the hard way because I did a drawing with cast shadows that were just way too harsh. So if you are interested in checking that video out after this one, it'll be linked down in the notes below. And that's a much shorter shorter video that is going to jump right to the main mistakes that artists make when drawing our autumn leaves. It's not a real time tutorial like this one. So I want to point out a couple things that I'm doing to keep the edges of those cast shadows soft. And just in case you're not familiar with the term cast shadow, cast shadow is the shadow that the leaf creates or casts onto the paper. They are not the shadows that are on the leaf itself. So here I am keeping those cast shadows soft by not actually outlining the cast shadows. Instead, I'm using these really soft circles or ovals to create a shape without an outline. I also didn't I also never drew these cast shadows in my initial drawing and didn't transfer any line work over. And that was intentional because A, the cast shadows might change a little bit as my lighting situation changed and I really wanted to make sure that those were true in color. And B, I didn't want any harsh lines that I would have to move around. I really did so much to keep this cast shadow super, super soft. So at this point, I'm actually starting to develop the lower part of the leaf a little more. And I'm not just taking one red and running through the whole leaf, even though this particular red exists in many other parts. I'm going to find those areas later, but I got really excited about this area and wanted to start connecting it to the cast shadow. And part of connecting the drawing to the cast shadow is making sure that the colors and values are accurate. So I needed to build up this area a little bit more. To do that, I start with an initial color impression. So in this area, I started with that brighter red and then I modulated it with a couple other reds and browns. I am building up the color in that area so that less and less of the white paper shows through. This is filling in the tooth and preparing the paper to be blended with odorless mineral spirits, which I'm gonna share a little bit later in this video. 
video. You're looking for about three to four layers of light to medium application of color. And I'm gonna show you what that looks like in this particular area. So my first layer of colored pencil is with this warm, natural orange color. And I am laying in the brightest areas in this segment. There's a dark pattern in the leaf here. So I have grabbed a darker brown and I'm mapping that in, but I'm keeping the edges really soft, just like how I did in my cast shadow, because I want this shape, this inconsistency in the leaf to feel part of the leaf. I'm bringing that same warm natural orange back over the top of the brown that I just laid down. Now I've got two layers of color in that particular area. And then I'm switching over to a yellow ochre color that is going to extend all the way to the edge of the leaf and help add some more warmth. That wasn't quite bright enough, so then I reached for an even brighter yellow, and then I connected it back to my initial orange. This is connecting that whole chunk of the leaf, and now with this red over the top, I've got about three light layers of color. Now I'm working on connecting this new chunk of leaf to the other chunk of leaf that I've worked on. And one of the main ways that I'm doing that is taking colors that I use predominantly in one area and feathering and blending them into the other area. So you'll see me bring the oranges in, you'll see me bring the reds back and forth and the yellows back and forth. I'm incorporating all of the other things that I've talked about so far. So I'm looking carefully at the edge of the veins as I put the color in so that I can keep the borders of those veins really clean and crisp. I'm keeping my pencils really sharp. In fact, I just sharpened this pencil. Razor sharp pencils can really work into the tooth of the paper, but they can also break, which this white one just did. So you've got to be careful that you're not really pressing super hard on the point unless you're adding in a really crisp detail. When I've got a sharp pencil, I yet like to work it on the edge. When I used the white in here, I was kind of burnishing a little bit, adding another layer of color over the top so that there was enough pigment on the paper to add the solvent. And I would consider this area that I just worked on to be solvent ready. It probably had four to five layers of light color application and the tooth was pretty much filled in, very little white speckling coming through. Now that I have that chunk of the leaf pretty much mapped out, I can start getting more specific with my cast shadow. And I now have something to refer to so I know how dark the cast shadow can be. Comparing one part of the drawing to another is a really important part of matching color and matching values. And that is why I am not a big fan of what I call photy, Fody, of what I call photocopying artists. Those are the artists that start on the top left corner and then they polish and finish everything as they move across and down their paper, finally finishing their entire piece in the bottom right corner. Almost like reading a book. You start at the top left corner and you're completely finished with the page when you move to the bottom. But you aren't reading, you are creating. And there is a push and pull, a back and forth. When someone was writing that book, they didn't finish it perfectly in one draft. They put something down, they responded to it, they added, they took away. And I think that that is a really important part of the drawing process and why I am such a fan of layering. This first layer that I am working on is just my first draft. It's my color impressions and my map for where I'm going. After I add the mineral spirits, I'm gonna come in with another layer and I'm going to continue to compare to add, to subtract, and it is those original value map ins right here with the cast shadow with the oranges and yellows around it. It is that information that allows me to get accurate in the final stages of my drawing. But if I jumped right to that cast shadow or I jumped right to the brightest orange and the little speckle imperfections, I am missing out on the opportunity to step back, to analyze, to make artistic decisions. And I honestly feel that if you're 
you're not willing to do that, then you're just really a technician working on a, a photocopy project, essentially like an inkjet printer left to right and finished when you get to the bottom. And there isn't really any fun or magic in that. Now that's a personal opinion and you can argue with me down in the notes below and the comments if you if you want to, if you disagree. And I love hearing alternate opinions, but I really would love you to sit with this idea and to ask yourself if you are giving yourself the opportunity to make artistic decisions or if you are just photocopying. You may or may not already know this about me, but I trained originally as an oil painter and I did this in high school and college and that was kind of my main predominant medium. And one of the main reasons that I switched over to colored pencil is that it was so easy to put them away to, to get started and to clean up. And, and with oil paint, you have kind of like a 30 minute starting and clean up process. So if I only had 30 minutes to work, it wasn't really a good use of my time. And so I started picking up dry media that I didn't have to worry about dry time or extensive setup and cleanup. But there are still times in my process that I feel it's really important to kind of sit down and give yourself the time for a full session. And I feel that laying out the initial structure or this first layer is one of those. So I like kind of started on this first lobe of the leaf, then I'm moving over to the other lobe of the leaf. And I am using a lot of the same processes, the same mark making and the same colors. And if that information is stored in my memory already, because I did it 10 minutes ago, then it's going to be a lot faster and more efficient on the second lobe. So this would be something that I would recommend setting aside a couple hours to lay out the initial first layer. And if, if you don't have that opportunity, you know, like try to get a 20 or 30 minute session and then grab another session later that week or later that day so that that information stays clear. What you don't want to do is get started on this leaf and then get completely distracted with life and other projects and not come back to it for a week and a half because then you might have cleaned up your colored pencils by then, you're looking for the colors, you're matching them all over again, and it doesn't become a very efficient process. If you can set the, some time aside to work on this all at once, you're going to be a lot more efficient and you're going to have a lot more continuity in your artwork. If you're curious about how my oil painting process connects now to my color pencil approach, I have a full course that breaks down oil painting, but with colored pencils. So we go through traditional oil painting techniques adapted for colored pencils, and there's a free trial of that course that includes a 30 minute lesson down in the notes below. So you can snag that if you're interested. In this lobe of the leaf, I am starting with the yellow colored pencil and I'm actually using quite a bit more pressure when I apply that yellow than when I come in over the top with the red. And there's a few reasons for this, but the main one is that yellow is a lighter color. It has a lighter value and so it is going to take more of it to mix in with the red. If I was making an orange with just these two colors, I would need probably two to three times as much yellow just to get an orange that's in the middle. And so when you are playing around with pressure in this initial layer, keep in mind that the color you're using and the value of the color, value meaning how light or dark it is, is going to affect how much pressure you use initially. And with your brightest, deepest colors, so your bright reds, your deep purples, your browns, your colors that are nearly black, you probably want to start off with a very light pressure and build it up slowly. Whereas with that champagne color that I used in the beginning to lay out the veins of the leaves, and when I come in with yellow, I'm coming in with a medium to even heavy pressure sometimes because I really want to punch those colors because they're they're lighter in value normally. And when I'm connecting that yellow piece to the red around it, I'm using colors in between those two colors to blend and to kind of bridge the gap. I've got that ochre yellow, now I have that earthy orange color, and those are allowing me to connect the red to the yellow a little bit more 
seamlessly. You heard me mention those colors that are almost black and that was really intentional. You've probably heard from me or from other artists that black is kind of a no-no with um, with color pencil and, and they include the black for an intentional reason. There are times when you use black, but my rule of thumb is to hold off on using black until the very, very, very end and then only using it to hit details or to add a little emphasis to an area that needs just a little bit more depth or just a little bit more value. The reason that I don't jump straight to black in these initial phases is that there are so many other colors available that have a deeper, more interesting color to them. So I mentioned that raisin color. Well, if I took that raisin color, which is a really warm, rich brown um, that's leaning towards red, and I mix that with a deep green or a deep blue, I would get something close to black, but it's gonna be a more vibrant, more interesting black with more depth to it. And if you have a really dark area, I encourage you to try to do that dark area with other colors first. This is one of the reasons why I feel like a really big set of colored pencils can be such a good advantage for students that are brand new to mixing colors or brand new to colored pencil because you have so many more options at your disposal and you don't necessarily have to know everything about color theory and mixing colors right away. You can grab a color that's really close to what you see in your reference or what you see in your in the photo that you're drawing from. But for every rule that we make in art, and rule I'm putting in air quotes here, um, there is a reason to break the rule. And working with a limited palette, meaning working with just a few very carefully um, selected colors can be a really great way to build your color theory knowledge as well. Sometimes I'll do a drawing with just three color pencils, like a red, yellow, and blue. And I will use this as an opportunity to really push my color and to get more creative with my mixing. And this is one of those times where black might come into my repertoire a little bit more. I've done some limited color palettes using black as my dark and then just two other colors. And so I, I say this as a caveat because there's always a reason and a time to break the rule. It's just doing so intentionally and understanding why artists, including me, say hold off on black for, for right now because there are more interesting options. But there are also great times to use black for limited palettes or to add those final details and, and the eyelashes and the little imperfections at the very end. This first layer of color is color impressions. And, and I've mentioned that earlier. When I say color impressions, I'm looking at the leaf and I am assessing just with my eyes what color would be closest. I'm not using any tools or apps. And, and here I'm adding in the green. And that is because that area got a little bit bright, a little intense, and the green plus the red can neutralize a bit. And when I go back and forth between the green and the red, that allows me to really fine tune the color that I am creating. So as you build up your first layer of an autumn leaf or anything else you're drawing and you're doing color impressions, not using any tools, um, allow yourself some grace to not get it right with the very first pencil. And, and actually, it's going to be more interesting if you lay down a color and then you say, oh, actually, it needs to be a little bit more intense, a brighter yellow. I'm going to add that in. Actually, it needs to be a little bit more red. I'm going to add that in. And colored pencils are transparent, so you can kind of see the entire process and the history of the drawing as you build it up, which is just so cool. If you are still here at this point, my guess is that you are enjoying this tutorial so far. And if so, could you please do me a favor and hit the like button? That will allow the algorithm to know that this is a quality video and to share it out with other people. And since this is a new format for me, I would love it if you gave me a little bit of feedback in the comment section. If you loved this and wanna see more of it, please let me know. And if you would like me to do real time, but do it a little differently, I'd love to hear that too. As you move around the leaf, you might follow a similar approach to me where you're doing one lobe of the leaf at a time. And I feel that having kind of a system of the way that you approach the leaf, that I'm going to do my mark in this way, I'm going to work from light to dark, or I'm going to start with my yellows, and then I'm going to work towards my reds. Those kinds of strategies help you become more efficient and more 
consistent in the process, but I also want you to be very uh, conscious about anywhere that the leaf breaks the pattern. So in what ways is this lobe of the leaf different from the previous lobe of the leaf? In what way is the color in this area different? Is it warmer? Is it cooler? And when you look for the things that break the rule or things that break the pattern, you are going to create a closer portrait of the leaf. Now, a portrait of the leaf, that sounds really silly, but think about a portrait of a person. When you're drawing your sister or your son or somebody close to you, you're paying really close attention to every way that their face is a deviation from the norm, how it's different from that template face that they say every face looks like, where the eyes are right in the middle and then the nose is centered between the eyes, about halfway between the eyes and the chin. There are all these rules, but that face in front of you or that face in your photograph is special and unique for all the reasons and ways that it breaks the rule. So having an idea of the overall structure, so I know that the eyes need to be kind of in the middle of the face between the top of the head and the bottom of the chin, that's going to help you get it in the realm of human and keep it from looking like um, a monkey or something where the eyes would be much further up on the head. But if you want it to look like the person that you're drawing, you are going to pay really, really close attention to all those special quirks. And the same is true for the leaf. This is one of, I think it was 12 to 14 leaves that I drew in this composition. And each one is special and unique. And I'm always looking for how is this one different from the other one? Well, this particular leaf is very red. I'm using really warm, really bright colors that are different from some of the more muted tones that I used in other leaves. This particular lobe that I'm working on is one of the brightest reds of them all, so I'm really punching that up. I'm also taking a look at the volume and how the volume changes on this leaf. It's a little bit more... Um, I, I think the word would be convex. It's coming out at me. I can feel the volume coming towards me. And if I were a little ant, I could crawl underneath it and I'd have a little cave underneath that. So I'm I'm looking at those special things and how they can be different. So one of the fun things about art is like, I, I mentioned this earlier, what's the rule? Be familiar with the rule, understand with why the rule is there, or in this case, be familiar with the pattern, understand why the pattern exists, and then figure out how it deviates from the pattern. How can you break the rule intentionally? But you need to understand it first. So I'm looking at this lobe. How does this lobe break the pattern or break the, the template of the lobes of the leaf? Well, there is this little highlight. And for right now, I've left it white, the white of the paper. If I were going to do a drawing without mineral spirits, I could leave it the white of the paper and I could allow all of the highlights to be the white of the paper showing through. But since I am planning to blend with solvent, I will need to cover that area up with colored pencil at some point. Here's a way that this lobe is following the pattern. So I'm looking at all the other lobes. They have this kind of dark edge along the bottom contour of the leaf uh, that is creating a boundary between that leaf and the cast shadow. So with my darker colored pencils, I've come in and I've edged out the contour of the leaf and I've left that edge a little bit heavier on the bottom, which is consistent with all the other lobes. Now it's time to address that highlight and I'm gonna start with yellow because that's keeping it consistent with the other highlights and lighter areas of the leaf. I am using a variety of different yellows to keep that temperature warm and bright and vibrant, but at this point I don't have quite enough colored pencil on it yet. I am bringing the reds in a little bit to blend and to transition that yellow to the rest of the lobe of the leaf, but before I blend with solvent, I probably will need to come in and lighten up that area a little bit more and add some more colored pencil. A cream or a light yellow like I used at the beginning with that, champ that champagne color would be a great choice for that area just to pump it up a little bit more and to have enough material so that it's going to respond positively to the solvent. 
Here I am edging out that bottom contour of the lobe of the leaf again, and we've talked about this several times now. This is going to be a really, really clean border, even cleaner than some of the others because the cast shadow of the leaf on this side under this lobe is very faint and very light. So I'm not gonna be able to correct the boundary of the leaf at all if it doesn't work out quite right. So I need to be very careful, very intentional with my pencil. This is a really, important place to keep the pencil really sharp. This is my raisin colored pencil again. It's super, super sharp and it's helping me map out the contours on all of the lobes of the leaf. On this next lobe, I am adding some dark contours on the bottom. I've also added some darker contours on the top too, but I'm not outlining so that it feels really natural. Here I've actually picked up the red and I have continued that contour with the red so that it kind of weights in between the darker raisin and the brighter red color. When I say weights in between, I am using weight, W-E-I-G-H-T, or the weight of an object. We talk about line as having weight. It has a heavier weight when it's a darker, bolder line. It has a lighter weight when it is a thinner, more economical line. And line weight is directly corresponds to line quality and you want a interesting and sophisticated line quality in your drawings where you vary the weight of the line, you keep it interesting, you break the line, it picks up in some areas, it is lost in another area and, and you use lines strategically to enhance your drawing, not to create boundaries and borders between one object and another. That's outlining and we don't want to do that. So let's do a quick recap on what we've learned about this first layer of colored pencil. Let's talk about Mark. If you're not laying down very conscientious uh, cross contour marks, you're doing small, soft ovals. This is what I'm doing right here with the red. I am working in small little ovals that allow me to evenly fill in the tooth of the paper. But I then will often deviate from that to help add structure to the boundary of, uh, of the leaf, or I will deviate from that circular uh, mark if I am creating a mark that is adding volume to the leaf or showing how it curves or wraps around. We are keeping our pencils as sharp as possible. Now, some pencils are going to hold a sharper point better than others. Derwent Light Fasts are really great. This orange had a great sharp point. This color, this darker purple color, does not have a very sharp point. I'm gonna need to fill in the tooth after that area with another color over the top. If you're working with waxy colored pencils like Prismacolor or even Luminance, they're not gonna hold as sharp of a point either. So do the sharpest point that you can, um, but allow yourself some flexibility there. You're gonna be able to fill in the tooth when you add the mineral spirits. You are applying several light layers rather than one heavy layer. Over the top of this initial red that I laid down, I'm now laying a cooler, more muted red so that I can just slightly nudge that color in another direction. Having several light layers shows the history of the drawing, creates more depth and more luminosity in your work. The light is able to pass through your layers, bounce off that white surface, and then come back to you, passing through each of those individual layers as it comes through. We are being thoughtful and careful with our cast shadows or the shadows that our object makes on the surface it's sitting on. For this particular piece, I am doing very soft edges so that the cast shadow doesn't draw attention or pull focus from the main attraction, which is the leaf. And when I do do have a mistake or something that I don't want, I am lifting it carefully with the kneaded eraser rather than rubbing it with a vinyl eraser. So we've also talked about pressure and the amount of colored pencil that we need on the paper before we can blend with solvent. This is a glaze of orange right here. That is pretty light pressure. I'm going over the entire surface with that orange. Now I'm going over with the yellow and I hope you noticed that there was a little more pressure there. Uh, I'm pressing a little harder, laying down more pigment. Back again with the red. Here I've got probably four layers of colored pencil and I can still put a tiny bit more down before that area has 
enough colored pencil to blend with solvent. Now there is some flexibility and there's a range of colored pencil that you can work with, but you wanna make sure you don't have too little because then there isn't really anything to be activated by the solvent. And you wanna make sure you don't have too much because too much color pencil often results in the tooth of the paper getting damaged and that there really isn't enough, um, enough tooth left to add final details over the top. Also, if you have tons and tons of colored pencil on your paper, it's going to uh, be more likely to turn into kind of a painty substance, which we don't quite want for this particular project. So if you're new to using solvent, Solvent, and, and I'm going to break that all down in just a second. Play around with the amount of colored pencil. Maybe you do uh, one little square with a light amount of colored pencil, one with the medium, one to heavy, and use solvent and blend each of those squares out so that you can get a feel for how much paper excuse me, so you can get a feel for how much solvent the, the paper can take and the colored pencil can take. And once you really internalize this, you'll know just how much colored pencil to apply to your paper before you add the solvent. Here, I am just kind of filling in the gaps. I'm going around and I'm checking to make sure everything has the right amount of colored pencil on it. I am unifying the drawing. I am taking one color all the way around so that, that it feels very unified, so that it feels complete. One of those areas you definitely wanna check are your lighter areas. Grab a white colored pencil or a lighter value colored pencil and go over the top of your highlights so that you can make sure that there is enough pigment in those areas. Similarly, you're gonna go over your cast shadows. Make sure that in those lightest areas and those softest edges of the cast shadow, you have enough material. You've got enough colored pencils so that the solvent can do something with it. You're also going to potentially punch your darks during this phase. You're going to make sure that your darks are dark enough. Now, they don't have to be quite as dark as your reference at this point because we're going to do another layer. But if there's a particular part of your drawing that doesn't have quite enough contrast, it's a good idea to come in and really punch those darks. Although we are looking closely at detail and we're looking closely at color and value relationships, relationships, we are not doing teeny tiny little details or the surface texture or imperfections at this point. If you see little bumps and freckles on the, on the leaf, leave those alone. Let those come back in the final stages because if you work on those and then blend with solvent, a lot of the really fine details might get softened and, and might not mean anything. I like to put those on at the very end. As you come to the end of this first stage of the drawing, you're going to start preparing it to be blended with solvent. You're gonna to want to move your colored pencils out of the way. At this point, I probably had like 30 colored pencils out and you don't wanna necessarily put those all away because then you'll have to find them again and that's not a great use of your time. So just set them to the side. I like to put them in a box lid so they don't roll off the table and break. And then I have those ready for phase two, which I'm definitely going to use a lot of the same colors in the second pass of the drawing. Okay, so now it's solvent time and I am not going to repeat everything there is to know about solvent because I actually have a video about that already. 10 things that you definitely need to know about working with solvent and colored pencils and that's gonna be linked down in the notes below. But one thing I do wanna mention is that you are going to wanna make sure that you are in an area that is well ventilated. So if you have a lot of open space in your studio, you're probably fine, but if you are in a little bunker, like I've worked in before, like kind of like a an old um, cold storage room was my previous studio. I had no windows and not a lot of airflow. So I would actually move my project to another part of the house and put it near an open window so that I had that ventilation. Uh, solvent is a slightly toxic chemical. It's safe to use if you are being careful with it. So um, if you are new to solvent or didn't know that about solvent, go check out that video um, and make sure you're using it safely before before you get started. So now I'm gonna talk about what I'm actually doing with this solvent. I have an old oil painting paintbrush. It's a synthetic brush with soft bristles, but they're very small. And I use this on small to medium projects so that I can really work on the details. I dip the paintbrush into my solvent and I wipe a little bit of the excess solvent on the edge of the container so that I am not drenching my project with solvent. If I do put a ton of solvent in an area, it can bleed into 
into other parts of the drawing and even bleed into the white areas of the paper, potentially staining the paper if I have some color already in my solvent and it's dirty. So I just wanna be careful with that and that I'm not bringing too much in. Then I'm working in like colors. So I started with all of the shadows. Those are all in that purple blue family. So I am not bringing unnatural colors into that area. Then I clean off my paintbrush on a piece of paper towel and I apply the solvent. I dip into the solvent again and apply into a new area. Now I'm working on the reds. But one thing I'm not going to do is drag that paintbrush that has red color pencil on it now into a very bright yellow area or into my green area. Did you see how orange that yellow went when the red came into it? I want to be very careful that I'm not doing that um, on accident, that I am in control of what's happening to my color. It doesn't move around quite as much as watercolor pencils. If you're familiar to that, you if you use watercolor pencils, you add the water and bam, it's paint. It's not quite like that, but it is moving around. The pigment is breaking away from the binder in the colored pencil and it's working it into the tooth of the paper. So you actually want to add some pressure to your paintbrush while you're doing this. I'm actually scrubbing in these circles much harder pressure than I used in the colored pencil application so that it really breaks down that connection and works the pigment into the tooth of the paper. One thing that I just love, love, love about colored pencil and solvent is that it actually intensifies lots of the colors. Notice how bright some of these reds are getting. They are so much more vibrant and rich when I add that solvent. And, and that can be a great way to pump up your artwork a little bit. But sometimes you get a color that you're not quite expecting. I've noticed this with reds and pinks and magentas. Sometimes they go a lot brighter than I expected them to. Or even like some blues, they'll do that to me too. I'm like, oh, I did not expect that color. And if the surprise of that makes you nervous, just swatch it on a piece of paper first. And, and you wouldn't need to swatch all your colors. Definitely not your earth tones. That's going to be pretty much what you see is what you get. But bright gem tones, um, bright pinks, blues, greens, those you might want to swatch first if you are not a fan of surprises. Odorless mineral spirits only takes about 10 to 15 minutes to dry. And once it's dry, you can immediately begin working with colored pencils over the top. So at this point, with that first layer of colored pencils, I've got a really solid base layer. I know where the brightest reds are. I know where the coolest reds are. I know where the greens are. I know where the value shifts. But what I don't have is that final sheen or that surface quality and texture of the leaf. I'm also missing the details. So that is going to be my goal and my main focus for this final layer of colored pencil. So let's talk about how we're gonna do that. The first thing I wanna mention is that the pressure has significantly changed from that first map in layer to the second final layer. I am using a mid to heavy amount of pressure depending on the color and the texture that I'm trying to render. Here I'm coming in with my white and this pencil is being pressed down harder than I would um, handwriting pressure. So think if you're writing with a ball pen, pen, ballpoint pen hard enough to imprint the paper behind it, that is the amount of pressure that it takes to lay the whites over the top of the existing color. At this point, I am zeroing in on one particular area. Here I'm working on this lobe of the leaf on the left side, third down, and I am really cleaning up all of the edges. I am working on the exact color matching and the surface texture and just everything. I'm taking it to the finish line and I'm not bouncing around a whole lot. Because I am right-handed, I typically start in the top left corner and I work my way over to the bottom right corner in this final pass. And I I mentioned before in the first layer that I hate that photocopying drawing when you work in the top left and you finish in the bottom right, but this is different because I have that framework down. I have something to compare it to, so I'm not going in blind, and I always have the option to come in and to add more detail and to continue refining. So the left to right, top to bottom is really just a way to protect my artwork and to avoid smudging. And another thing that I'm doing to protect against smudging is 
having a piece of tracing paper or a piece of glassine underneath my hand while I'm working. And you can see that in the right side of the frame. During this second phase of the drawing, I'm also using more colored pencils. Here I am using a bright orange, now an earthy orange. I am frequently changing out my colored pencil so that I can really get precise in the color that I'm going for. Now I'm coming in with a gray and I'm toning down that white vein that I laid in. It was a little too intense. There really isn't anything that is perfectly bright white in this composition or in, in the reference leaf at all, but coming in with that white allowed me to pull the value up and then I can glaze over it and tone it down. Now I'm coming in with a couple different greens. I started with a brighter green. Now I'm using a darker, more muted green so that I can push those darker parts a little darker. When I take a green over the top of a red area, the green and the red are complementary colors. They mix together and they create a more muted brown or a neutral color. And that brown neutral color is a lot more interesting than, the, than just picking up a brown out of your pencil case. There's no hard rule about using brown, just like there's no hard rule about using black. And there's really nothing wrong with it, a brown. Sometimes you'll need to grab for one. But could you mix up a brown using two complementary colors instead? Would it give you a more interesting result? Would it be a richer color? Would it blend into the areas surrounding it more? And, and my argument is yes. I think that more often than not, there is a more interesting alternative than brown. And on your next piece, try to do that. See if you can eliminate or limit the number of browns that you're using. Even if you are drawing something that is in fact brown, you're drawing a chocolate cupcake. Could you use more violets in your, as you build up that brown? Could you use reds and greens to, to complement and to find other colors, other richness in the, in the brown object that you're drawing? So I've reached for a white and just like I did that vein, I'm coming in with a lot of pressure so that I can really lift the value in that particular area. And then I'm coming in with a darker color so that I can push those darker values and start creating a nice, clean, crisp edge that defines the boundary between the leaf and the cast shadow. And I am using a lot of different colors in this area. Here I'm back to like a warm red brown color, probably that raisin again. And then I am in bringing up the intensity with a super bright orange. And then I am bringing up the value with the white. It's a push and pull. It's a lot of different things going on at once. And, and now I'm really changing the mark. I am doing that cross contour line so that I can bring the um, illusion of those little veins coming through the, the lobe of the leaf and, and give it a little bit more dimension. Now I'm shifting over to the cast shadow and I really want to talk about how I'm doing that. I am using a lot of cool colors. I started with that lavender color, then I came to the gray. Now I'm switching into a blue. I'm using a ton of pressure here, really burnishing it. And then I'm switching over to the lightest blue. This is another one of my very favorite colors in this set. It's the light aqua. I am burnishing so hard you can see the table shaking and moving a little bit. And then as I move to the edge of that cast shadow, I transition to white and I keep that edge really, really soft. And you can see how that edge of the cast shadow just starts to disappear as it moves away and how that contrasts against the much sharper edge of the leaf, which is something I'm going to continue to work on in this particular area. As I come to a finishing or a stopping point on this lobe, I'm still paying really close attention to the direction of the mark and that final surface texture that is resulting from that. Here I'm using yellow as a glaze. So when I mention glaze, that's a transparent layer of color and that can happen in lots of different ways. A glaze can be something that happens very lightly and transparently and you saw a lot of those in that beginning first layer. But you can also do these kind of burnish glazes where you can use quite a bit of pressure with, this is typically happening with a lighter, more transparent color and you can go over an entire area and it really helps to unify that area 
and blend the color. And that's exactly what I did with that yellow. And I do it at several points throughout the rest of this drawing. And I'll continue to bring your attention to that as I bring those glazes in. But here I am working in a, a more red part of the drawing. So I'm probably not going to be glazing with yellow. Instead, I will be unifying the area with reds. And I'm pushing and pulling between unification and drawing attention and creating difference. And here I really want that vein to pop out. So I am starting by almost outlining it, but then I am feathering it into a shape as I draw it away. So I've got a nice crisp, um, definition happening in that vein but as I come away from it with that darker red it isn't it isn't being outlined heavily so I mentioned earlier when I started the second layer that one of my goals is surface texture and before you start rendering the texture of the leaf I think it's important to kind of understand and to be able to describe the texture of the leaf so if you were to feel this texture of the leaf and I'm sure everybody's picked up an autumn leaf before without crunching it you're just smoothly rubbing your fingers over the top there it is going to be very smooth it's going to it you're not going to feel um, like a grit or a bumpiness so you're going to want your marks to echo that smoothness but this is a leaf that is in the process of changing color and you're not necessarily feeling that change, but you can see it. You can see that one color is bleeding into the next and that that is sometimes happening very gradually, but in other places it's happening in a much more grainy, irregular way. So really focusing on that kind of grainy texture in certain areas is a big way that I'm able to achieve the texture of this leaf. I am working mostly in those small ovals and I'm varying the pressure so that sometimes I am pressing really hard with a darker color and really pulling out that grainy texture and then other times where it's not as grainy I'm burnishing over the surface and really smoothing out particular areas. So here I've skipped ahead quite a bit. My camera stopped recording for quite a bit of this, but from here on out, I'm gonna talk about the exact decisions that I'm making, why I'm doing that, and really what I am talking about here can be applied to that part we skipped over as well. So I have a lavender colored pencil right now, and lavender or purple and yellow are complementary colors, and I'm using that along the edge of that yellow area to neutralize the color and to tone it down. When an area gets too bright or too intense, a really great way to neutralize it is to work within the complements. If I came in with a really dark, heavy purple though, that would have completely overpowered that area of the yellow. So instead I started with a lighter value purple, that lavender color, and that is um, another really great uh, color pencil in this set. I really like having a wide variety of lighter colors to choose from so that I, I can really play in those lighter values more. And this is the Derwent Light Fast line has a great set of lighter colors, but so does the Caran d'Ache line and so does Prismacolor if you're using those. So if you have like a 12 or a 24 set, you can always upgrade by just going and buying a few open stock light value colored pencils. So now I am back to that lavender and between now and then I, I layered a lot more colors, but I'm coming back to those colors that I already used and I am neutralizing the reds and I'm also building up the shadows and having those lavenders in both the leaf and the cast shadow is going to unify the leaf and the cast shadow. It's going to help them feel like they belong together. Now I am using, I used the, that cool steely gray for a while and I, then I'm transitioning to the blue. I really didn't want to overdo it with the grays, although they do help um, build up the value a little bit more, but it was a big goal to have a lot of life and color in these cast shadows. So I really leaned into the light blues and that light aqua. And then at the very edge, I'm finishing it off by burnishing with white. And when I'm burnishing, I'm using a lot, a lot of pressure and that soft edge looks soft because it is in contrast to the sharper edges around it. And I'm usually doing that a lot more delicately. Here I have a very dark, 
probably a brown or a violet. I can't remember and can't see, but I'm using that really sharp, dark colored pencil to edge out the corner of the leaf. And I'm not heavily outlining this whole lobe of the leaf. Instead, I'm just picking those darkest areas. I'm adding some more value there, and then I am feathering it out in between. So it feels like a very natural transition without heavily outlining. I am using that, that vein texture again where I come in with the white and then I tone it down with another color so that I can get the color that I want without it being bright white. And then I'm coming in with the colors that I see in the leaf to clean up and, and get more uh, specific and articulate with the vein. So here I'm coming in with that muted red and I am narrowing the vein. I'm creating some sharpness in there and, and I'm creating a line that is more narrow, more precise than I could do with just the pencil alone. Honestly, if I sharpen my white pencil super sharp and then I come in with a lot of pressure hoping to get a really fine line, it always breaks. And so I usually lay down a, a thicker, heavier line and then just clean it up with the area, with the colored pencils around it so that I, I'm kind of working negatively, if that makes sense. I'm, I'm uh, cutting into that area. And, and here I'm just lightening up the edge of that uh, of the lobe of the leaf and you can see the direction of my mark it's helping me add volume to those areas white is a great color to burnish with if I'm if I'm pressing with a medium amount of pressure I can lighten up that area but still keep the color underneath it and really fill in the tooth of the paper so that can be a great strategy and and a great um, exercise to practice on a separate sheet of paper lay down some color and then burnish with white and see what happens to your color as you burnish with white, then try it with another color. Try burnishing with a light blue, like what I'm doing in, in the cast shadows. If you haven't already noticed, I definitely have a bias towards brighter, more vibrant colors. But if I used only super bright, super intense colors, my leaf wouldn't have a very realistic quality to it. It would feel kind of like a circus rainbow experiment gone wrong. And, and the way that I help my bright colors really stand out and have impact is by mixing in neutral colors with them so that there is a contrast. That bright color looks bright because it is next to a neutral and so you might occasionally see me use a gray to burnish out certain areas and that is doing exactly that it's neutralizing those areas and having a wide variety of grays in your set that you can use to neutralize areas so that your brights look brighter and are more impactful can be so key you can also really leverage the muted colors in in your collection. So those muted reds, this is like a terracotta brown color, much more neutral, and it is next to that bright lime green. So they're playing really nicely together, but if I only use the bright lime green and I only use the bright red, it's not going to actually be as impactful and those bright colors aren't going to do as much. I had that bright green and now I'm using a darker, more muted green and I'm feathering it out and I'm connecting it. So here is a perfect example of me using the gray to really neutralize and subdue a particular area. This is a light gray. That's not the exact name of the color, but it is working perfectly to just kind of soften up those yellows. And if I soften them up a little too much or the value didn't go quite light enough, I can always use my white to pull the value back up. And then I can intensify it again with some more yellow. And this, I hope, is showing you that there isn't one specific path to the finish line when you're drawing anything. You could get to a very similar end product but take a completely different path than me. Um, and, and so, if you chose to watch this video and do it as a tutorial, and if you took us a different path or you responded differently or you used a different color, that is totally fine. Here, I'm doing that glaze again. I'm unifying the whole top of the leaf by glazing over it with yellow. And you can tell that I'm using less pressure because of my hand position. I'm holding that pencil further back and that allows me to use the side of the pencil rather than the tip. When I choke up more on a pencil like right here, 
here, I am usually applying a lot more pressure and I'm using a different part of the pencil. This is the only pencil that I used on this piece that wasn't the light fast set. This is a Derwent drawing colored pencil and the pencils in this collection are a lot waxier, a lot softer, and they do allow me to lay down a more opi opaque, excuse me, opaque white than I can with the light fast colored pencils. So that's kind of a fun one to add to your collection. It's a little waxier than a Prisma colored pencil. It's pretty much like the most opaque white out there. Here's a glaze with purple that I'm doing. So I'm unifying an area and subduing it a little bit. Going over an entire area with that light lavender color is going to help mute it down and connect it. And I think that these glazes are super, super important on this piece because the colors change really like irregularly and erratically and having that glaze go over the top really helps to unify it and bring it back together. In the last few minutes of working on this leaf, I've really changed up my approach quite a bit. Instead of looking at it piece by piece, I'm looking at it holistically. I'm taking the whole leaf into consideration and I'm making bigger decisions, like those glazes that unify specific areas of the leaf. This is a great time to reach out to friends and family members or a critique group online and ask for feedback. What does my piece still need? How can I make it just a little bit better? I hope that you enjoyed this tutorial. Thank you so much for taking the time to watch it all the way to the end. And I'd love to hear what you would like me to draw next. So give me some feedback on this tutorial and let me know what you want to see um, in upcoming videos down in the comments below and have a wonderful rest of your day. Thanks. Bye.